Okay, good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday morning to you. Uh, hopefully you guys have had a great week and uh, that life is good for you. Um, we got to do our annual uh, pumpkin patch uh, pictures last night, uh, which is always a joy, maybe. Uh, but we had those last night, so uh, we made it through and nobody nobody cried and nobody uh, nobody got angry, so that was a good thing. Um, uh, actually, our kids are older now, so it's a lot easier to do that. Anyway, uh, hopefully you guys are having a good week, and um, we pray for uh, people that are hurting. We pray for people that are struggling with some things in their life, and we've had some family members in our church that uh, have lost loved ones and are just struggling. Um, that's a hard thing to walk through, and so we pray uh, for God to comfort them and to encourage them, and for us as family of believers, uh, as a family of believers, we would come alongside of them and care for them. And So we sent out an email yesterday just reminding people, um, uh, letting people know actually that there's going to be a, a celebration of life service for Jane Gibbert. Uh, that's going to be next Saturday, the 30th of October, um, here at the church building, and um, it'll be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So love to have you come and support uh, Jane's family. Uh, her husband Brian and her two boys Nick and Wally and their families and so uh, and a whole bunch of grandkids so um, just would appreciate you guys being prayer for her uh, and prayer for her family and uh, Jane was a long time faithful member here at Lake Eustis serving in all kind of different capacities um, was very instrumental in our ministry called Stevens ministry where it's a mentorship uh, encouraging ministry uh, similar to counseling ministry uh, she was uh, really instrumental in that and so she is definitely going to be missed in, in a lot of ways uh, but she uh, made a huge difference in people's lives and so we appreciate that and we're going to celebrate that uh, next Saturday so if you're interested to come on out and join us for that <coughs> so today we're in Matthew 26 continuing the, the ministry of Jesus um, this today we're going to see uh, the story um, uh, that takes place on Thursday evening, uh, beginning of Passover and uh, beginning of this kind of uh, get the ball rolling down the road toward the cross that's going to take place. We're going to see the arrest happen on this day, uh, all these other things. So we'll talk about that here today. But I'm going to read. I just want to read this in this scripture in its entirety in, in just a few moments, and, and I hope you guys are okay with that, um, because I just want to make mention of a couple of things. Actually, we're going to talk a little bit about what is not talked about in this chapter, uh, at least in Matthew's gospel. John records some different things for us, not not different, but uh, more details in, in the story. So, uh, first of all, let me just read verse 14 and through 16, because this thing is important. Uh, in chapter 26 of Matthew, it says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him, that's Jesus, over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver, and from then on Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Um, here's an interesting dynamic, and, and I just want to throw this out there. Um, have you ever thought that, that there's probably there's probably great truth in that everybody has a price at some level? I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Uh, we, we look at Judas and we think, for 30 pieces of silver, you were willing to sell out Jesus? You were willing to turn your back on him, abandon him, right? Give him over to these horrible, evil people that were going to torture him? Is that... You would do that for 30 pieces of silver? Yet, what do we sometimes do uh, in order to get what we want? Um, do you have a price that you would sell out? I don't know. Hopefully not. Hopefully we are faithful, right? The Bible tells us that we should count the cost to following Jesus. Uh, that we would say there is no measure of wealth. There's nothing that I wouldn't... Uh, give up to keep Jesus in my life, right? Uh, that I'm all committed to Jesus. We'd like to say that, and I hope we are, and that's obviously our goal. But I, I wonder sometimes, is there a price that we would sell out? Is there a price where we would say, you know what? This temptation of what I get 
is much better than what I think I have with Jesus. Um, I would just, I just say that to caution us because here's a guy who spent three some odd years walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus, right? Interacting with Jesus, watching the miracles, listening to the teachings. I mean, he was as close to Jesus as you can get. And yet, in a moment of weakness, he was willing to sell it for some money, give it all away for some money. And I just want to caution us that if we're not careful, I think that we could easily be bought out if we're not careful. And so I just want to caution us in that. Make a decision that today there's nothing that's going to take you from the Father. There's nothing that could lure you away, tempt you away. Uh, so that being said, let me jump into verse 17. We get into this thing where Jesus institutes uh, communion. So Jesus tells them on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, he tells them, hey, go into the city and find the person that we're going to be uh, meeting at their house. And he kind of gives some instructions on how to do that. Skip down to verse 20. They're, they're there for the Passover meal. In verse 20, it says, When evening came, Jesus in, was reclining at the table with the twelve. That's important to recognize. He's with the twelve. He's not with... Um, He's not with the 120. He's not with a bunch of other people. This is just the 12, his core group of disciples. And while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after another, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. And Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand in the bowl, into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go um, just as it is written about him. Woe to, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day that I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So there's a lot going on in this text. And I think it's important we just make a couple mentions here. Actually, this is such a significant text that we're not going to be able to cover it all in just one sitting here. We're going to talk a little bit about it tomorrow as well. hope that's okay with you guys. It doesn't really matter if it's okay because I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, but this chapter teaches me something about closeness with Jesus that it gives, me, uh, gives us a little indication of Jesus's, um, Jesus's desire and his willingness to have relationship with us his willingness to serve. Um, but it also gives us a unique glimpse into not everyone has intimacy with Jesus, right? Not everybody has intimacy with Jesus. That is a that is a, a, an invitation-only thing. Now, let me explain that. So what we don't see in Matthew's gospel, we see a little bit different in the book of John. So John records a little bit different. Uh, he gives us more detail in that night. Um, and so Matthew's gospel tells us they sit down, they have the evening meal, and Jesus announces to them, hey, one of you is going to be betray me. So they spend the next few minutes, maybe an hour, I don't know, discussing amongst themselves, kind of getting Jesus by himself. Uh, hey, it's not me. I'm not the guy, right? You're not, you're not saying I'm going to be the bad person. I'm not the one that's going to betray you. Jesus hears them kind of talking about this, and he says, listen, it's the one who dips his hand in the bowl with me. Right? So they would have been reclining at the table. Jesus would have been kind of uh, leaning back on one elbow at the table. So he'd be facing one of the disciples. He'd be um, with his back to the other disciple. Uh, John's gospel says that, uh, that John, the one Jesus loved, leaned back against Jesus and asked him, Lord, is it who's going to be betraying you? Um, so it means that John was close to Jesus, but it also means that Judas was close to Jesus because Judas would have been dipping his hand in the bowl with Jesus. And so Jesus identifies him. What Matthew's gospel doesn't tell us, John's does, it tells us that at that moment, uh, Judas gets up and leaves. 
he leaves uh, the upper room and he does not come back. The next time we see Judas, he is leading this battalion of people to come and arrest Jesus in the garden. So what Matthew's gospel doesn't tell us, John does tell us some interesting details. And I think this is so important to recognize. So in John's gospel, what takes place is that John says after the meal, Jesus does something unique. And Jesus gets up and he gives, um, John gets up, or Jesus gives up and he puts on a towel. He takes off his outer laying a layer of clothes and he takes a, a wash towel and a basin of water and he goes and he washes the disciples feet and it says that he goes and he washes their feet finally he gets to peter and peter's like oh don't do it and jesus says no i need to do it and all that kind of stuff but what i find is interesting about that is that jesus washes their feet then he comes back to the table right then he has this discussion about who's going to be betraying him judas then leaves the table and then jesus institutes communion he has communion with him the last uh, supper, right? This idea of inst talking about the bread and talking about the cup, the the bread being his body, the fruit of the vine being his blood that he was shed for us. But what's interesting to me is that Judas was there to be wa to have his feet washed, but he was not there for communion. I think this is significant. I think this is interesting for a couple of different reasons. One is the fact is that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Right now, Jesus could have easily got to Judas and thought and said to himself, "Well, man, he's not—he's not worthy for me to wash his feet. Uh, I know what he's getting ready to do to me. I know that later tonight he's going to sell me out. I'm going to be arrested tomorrow morning. I'm going to be on the cross." Jesus knew that. Yet Jesus washed Judas's feet, not because he was worthy, not because he was good. He washed him because it was the right thing to do. It was a posture of service. It was a posture of being a servant to all. And that's what Jesus said he was. He said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was a servant. And so here's some a really interesting point that I think is important to grasp, is that Jesus served people not based on their worthiness or how good they were or if they had their life put together and their act together. He didn't do that. He washed Judas's feet just the same as he washed Peter's feet. Just the same as he washed John's feet and James' feet and the other disciples' feet. I mean, he washed their all their feet, not based on worthiness. And so that's important for us that, you know, we serve people not because of what they can give us, right? Because Judas is going to sell Jesus out. We don't serve people because of uh, maybe getting attention. We don't serve people because they're good and they are worth it. We serve people because they're made in the image of God. And everyone deserves that in their life, to have value put on their life. Um, but what's also interesting about this is that John's gospel tells us that as soon as Jesus discusses the one who's going to betray him and Jesus dips his hand in the bowl with Judas, right? It says Judas then leaves. Actually, Jesus actually dismisses Judas. He says, go and do what you need to do. Judas leaves. Jesus knowing full well what he's going to do. And then Jesus institutes communion. I think that's significant. That while, yes, everyone gets served, everyone gets, um, everyone gets blessed by Jesus, there's an invitation to those who are close to Jesus that is intimate. Um, there was an intimacy there with the other disciples who had not betrayed him, who had not done those things. Now, what's also cool about this is that Jesus, he knew, he knew Peter was going to do this as well. He knew Peter was going to lie about knowing Jesus. There's a difference here. We'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow. There's a difference between completely abandoning Jesus, not walking with Jesus, and slipping up and making uh, sinful mistakes and things of that nature. There's some differences there. We'll talk about that tomorrow. But, but Peter gets to stay for communion because Jesus knew he was not abandoning him, right? There's a closeness, there's an intimacy that not everyone gets to be involved in. Not everyone gets that because of their willingness to be obedient to Jesus, because of their willingness to surrender completely to him. And so I just think that's important. So what I want to take out of this today is in, in terms of the people that we live around, um, there are, there are people around us all the time that we should serve them regardless of whether they're worthy of it, good enough, have earned it, none of that, right? It doesn't matter. We serve people 
because they're people made in the image of God. But there is a closeness and relationship that sometimes we don't want to have with people who are not of common faith with us. And I just want to encourage you to think about that. I also want to encourage you to think uh, and, and pray, Lord, is, is there anything that's potentially keeping me from being intimate with you? Like Judas, like, is there something going on in my life that I that, that is a barrier for me to come close to you, that's restricting me in my relationship with you? So I just want to encourage you to think about that. If there is anything like that, begin to root that out. Begin to confess that before the Lord. Begin to say, Lord, I, I need you to help me overcome this and surrender completely to you. So um, just be mindful of that today. Let's pray. God, we are grateful that you are uh, perfect, you are loving, you are graceful. Uh, God, we thank you for the example that you give in the scripture that uh, serving others is not based on worthiness, but it's based on the fact that we are image bearers of you. Um, I thank you, God, that you give us the example of Judas, uh, of how easy it is sometimes to uh, sell, be sold out um, toward other things rather than Jesus, to get distracted of what's most valuable in life. Help us to not become like that. Help us to make the commitment to be fully sold out to you, Jesus, in all things. And we just pray your blessing over our life. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Hope you have a good day. Thanks for joining us this morning. We'll see you tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Or be here tonight. we got Bible studies um, tonight here at uh, Lake Eustis, also in Paisley as well. So anyway, hope to see you then. If not, tomorrow morning. All right. God bless.